Welcome everybody to Frankfurt School. Welcome Madame Nui, Chair of the ECB Supervisory Board. Welcome Frau Lautenschläger, Vice Chair of the ECB Supervisory Board and member of the Executive Board of the ECB. It's an honor to have you here at Frankfurt School. Um, welcome students, staff, faculty, friends, welcome journalists here to the ECB Youth Dialogue at Frankfurt School. I'm Andreas Horchler. I'm in charge of uh, communications here at Frankfurt School. I promise this is not going to be about us on stage uh, giving speeches uh, today in our Audimax, uh, as many of you are used to. It's going to be about you, your questions, and your remarks uh, to our guests today. We're not forgetting that we call this event a dialogue, and that's what it will be. And uh, I'm very curious to have your questions later on. Uh, with your questions, either live or via Slido online, uh, you see that, please uh, get out your phones and program Slido. And um, no wonder our code today is ECB. Uh, so that fits, I guess. Um, and now, without further delay, uh, please welcome Professor Michael Grote. Uh, Vice President, Academic Affairs here at Frankfurt School uh, for introductory remarks and a welcome here to Frankfurt School to our guests. Please, Michael. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Madame Louis. Thanks a lot, Frau Lautenschläger, for being here. This is a great opportunity for us uh, to get into dialogue. Well, Andreas, looking at you and me, it's probably the young and the young at heart or something like this. Um, but it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here, seriously. So the, um, I, you two, you don't really need introduction. Um, but it's, uh, it's probably fair to say uh, that uh, you two belong to the architects and uh, the heads uh, of European banking supervision. And, European, and with this, European financial stability. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, we have the two main figures of European um, banking supervision with us tonight. And we were just uh, talking uh, minutes before. So are there uh, any questions left? And yes, there are many questions left, right? So the, it's, it's not set. The speed of change in regulation did come down a bit, um, but still there's a lot of work uh, in front of us. And also um, the students, that means also a lot of work uh, in front of you. Uh, no matter from which side you're looking at this, uh, either from being regulated or from regulating, right? So there's, it's not yet settled. Probably uh, it will be never settled. So we're talking about the uh, stability um, mechanism, the single, um, supervisory mechanism, uh, and so in theory at least, this should be, uh, so governance should be somewhat problematic, right? You have national supervisors, you have European supervisors, uh, you have this attached to the ECB, ECB who is responsible for monetary policy, so uh, this could be one of the cases uh, where theory predicts trouble, practice works fine, right? We'll hear about this from your side, right? So the, that well, we look at this. So, and uh, Frankfurt School is proud uh, to host this event. Uh, we have a long history as banking academy, starting back in 1957. So uh, it is something, uh, our students have been regulated since ever, right? That's something pretty normal. Uh, and we're very much uh, used to this. So either, uh, and, and regulation is in many of what we, many programs uh, that, that we run be it in executive education or in academic programs. Uh, and what I found out over the last years, I think, is again another shift in perception of regulation. So let's say before 2007, 2008, regulation was something that you try to avoid. Right? Then after 2008, not surprisingly, um, there was a phase when regulation was something was asked for uh, banks also needed guidance uh, and uh, your general kind of positive view. Now, I think regulation has ceased to be a daily topic, 
right? I'm sure this might be different in Italy now, but in, in general, this is something you just accept as a given, right? So it kind of sank in to normal. Um, nevertheless, uh, the, um, the next test for the new European regulatory framework is surely ahead. No one knows when, but we are pretty sure uh, there will be instances where this new framework is going to be tested. Uh, you both are responsible for shifting this away from us in time, uh, and also you're both responsible for designing the framework that is going to be tested. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to your statements and to your questions and answers. Uh, and again, I invite uh, all of you uh, to ask everything you ever wanted to ask uh, about your banking supervision. This is the time. Uh, you won't get more exp expert level knowledge uh, than these two. Thanks a lot for being here. I'm looking forward to this evening. Great, thank you. Thank you, Professor Grote. Thank you again, ladies, for being here on stage. Uh, and forgive me, having this handheld microphone, I couldn't uh, withstand it because I have such a long uh, history in being a reporter. So um, I am so used to this that uh, I couldn't resist it. Um, welcome to Frankfurt School once more. Um, uh, Daniel Nui and Sabine Lautenschlager. We had, in our meeting up front, we calculated a little bit. We have 60 years of expertise in banking supervision on stage together. 68 years. Now, can you imagine <laughs> this? And, you know, there are some students here who might say, um, well, all this law stuff, all this regulation, that's so boring. Is it boring? It's not boring at all. I am uh, 68, soon to be 69, and I am learning every day, really. Sometimes more than I ever dreamed to learn. For example, when we had to close uh, Latvian banks, I knew nothing about uh, Latvian law. I had to learn it fast. We had to learn it fast together. Uh, but, well, no, it's never boring. It's not enough boring, as a matter of fact. Sometimes you would like to uh, prepare on Friday afternoon for a nice weekend, uh, a little bit of rest. And no, it's not possible. There is a, a bank somewhere de doing stupid things, and we have to prepare something, some action. <laughs> Can you second this? Well, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when you want to be a good supervisor, you need to, to be an active one. So... If you want to have a little bit of action, you need to go into banking supervision. It's full of action. Yeah? Um, I join her sometimes a little bit too much um, <laughs> action. Um, no, it's, it's one of the most sexiest jobs you can have, for sure. All right. Thank you for this initial statement. We take more than 2,000 decisions per year in banking supervision. How many do you take per year on monetary policy, Sabine? Because she has another job on top of that. Huh? She has monetary <laughs> policy. <laughs> I so, say now. <laughs> it will be depressing. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a little direction here up front that uh, this is not going to be mainly about monetary policy, of course, but this is going to be about supervision, about uh, an entity that just came to life. Uh, I would say, in comparison in European affairs, something that would be a blink of an eye, namely less mm -hmm. than a year. You built up a new multilingual, multi uh, in international uh, body that now is in charge of supervising banks. How did it go so fast? Well, uh, because uh, we knew that it had to, to come fast, uh, we had a tough deadline. Uh, we were supposed to take over supervision uh, in November 2014. Uh, we could have six more months, but to have six more months was considered a kind of a defeat, not a good achievement. So from day one, we were certain that we would do that before, before November. And we were a, a tiny uh, startup uh, in a powerful incubator, the ECB, 
without the ECB, it would not have been possible. But uh, I started on 2 January 2014. I had left in Paris 1,100 people that I was managing in banking supervision, in insurance supervision. And I had two secretaries, on top of myself, I had two secretaries, a counselor, and the secretary of the supervisory board. So I was feeling very light, really, for <laughs> once. Uh, and then uh, it started uh, pretty fast. But you probably want to add to that, uh, Sabine. Well, I came four weeks later, yeah? And I think we had increased already four times or so. We were 12 um, uh, uh, then. Did, did uh, you know each other? Before? We know yes. each other for many, many years, even decades, because France and Germany sit together next to each other in the Basel Committee. So, so we were always next to each other when um, arguing, negotiating, discussing, and deciding about um, global standards. Yeah. Um, hence, we um, well, we, we work together very well in the Basel Committee. Huh? Yes, absolutely. And we even work better um, in, in, in this field. No, um, let us just, I mean, think about it. We got 26,000 applications, if I remember correctly, in this first year, 26,000, which had to be pr processed. Yeah, so that's what Daniel means with the incubator. Yeah, there were HR people, IT people um, of the ECB helping us. Yeah, um, um, we looked for about 1,000 staff, I think, in the first yes. year. We have 28 different nationalities. Um, the only language which all of them, uh, who all of them understand, is English. Yeah, um, uh, banks um, have to get uh, accustomed and got accustomed to using English too. Uh, 128 banking groups huh? with 1,200 banks um, um, under supervision. And the, and the major challenge, I think, was to have the comprehensive assessment in parallel of building up the yeah, institution. Definitely. You know, without staff doing a comprehensive assessment is quite Right. Interesting. Right, it is. And uh, mm -hmm. given, given that we, we have a youth dialogue here, uh, what kind of people signed up for these multitude of new jobs? All kinds of people, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And what is interesting as well is that uh, the, the, the core recruitment is different depending on the countries. Uh, my assessment is that it's more uh, lawyers in Germany. In France, it's more uh, maths for uh, insurance on uh, big banks or business schools as well, where you have a good mix. Uh, but in my view, what is important is to have a strong uh, education somewhere on which you build. On the rest, you can learn. You will learn during your uh, professional life. Uh, we need statisticians. We need uh, IT people. We need lawyers. We need mat mathematicians. We need statisticians. Yeah. A lot of people. Um, many, f yeah, many came from the NCAs, from the National Competent Authorities, who you know, uh, people who had already experience as a banking supervisor. Uh, we got uh, some people from auditing firms, uh, some bankers uh, uh, too, yeah, which is, I think, a change in, in the perspective as well as in the working environment when you go from the private sector to the public uh, sector. Yeah? Um, um, I, I mean, what I, I, I might uh, share a joke with you because I heard many bankers saying we always thought um, that you had uh, more regular working times when you are in the public sector. Forget it. Yeah? Um, um, it was worse, they say. Okay. It was worse than in banks. Okay. Yeah? Um, so um, we had, um, well, we had lawyers, yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, um, uh, some, some even historians, I mean, his historic people who study history, you know, yeah, yeah, but yeah um, not so many probably, not so many, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, at the end, you yeah. need to have a certain kind of intelligence, yeah. a certain kind of active behavior, yeah, when you are too, um, how can I say this, when you are not outspoken enough, you cannot talk to banks telling them, I don't like what you do, so you need to be a little bit forceful, yeah, um, not a shy person, as a banking supervisor, you are usually not a shy person, Absolutely. Yeah? yeah, and we are, you will see this in the next hour to come, uh, very difficult to stop when talking. Okay, okay, we'll see. Yes, <laughs> all right. That's correct. <laughs> Agreed so. upon. Uh, in, in, in this adventure, uh, having to do it so quickly, uh, has there ever been a point where you thought, okay, we might fail, we m might not manage? 
No, that was not an option. And momentum is, uh, is an asset quite some time. When you have a tough deadline, you deliver. When you believe you have plenty of time, you lose your time into details and you don't move fast enough forward, in my view. Mm -hmm. See? Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't start a work thinking about I might be failing. <laughs> one one uh, little uh, uh, remark here. The Slido is filling up. I have a little iPad here where I can read. We don't need to turn our heads later on. Yeah. Uh, what we will uh, try to do later on is that we always want to have a mix. One question from Slido, one question uh, live from the floor if we manage to do so. So not only Slido, we want to hear voices as well. Um, I oh, like the first yeah. question already very much. Uh, mm -hmm. You like it very much? Yes, I like hold it on, very much. Hold on. Not hmm. answering right you now. You raised my curiosity. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so talking to uh, students, many students studying finance, studying management here at Frankfurt School in this youth dialogue, um, if you could go back, so um, four years in time, five years in time, would you set up the uh, single supervisory mechanism the same way as it is uh, in action right now, or would you do some little things maybe differently? I would say broadly the same. I don't even see well, what we will do that differently. Well, I think there, there is room for improvement, yeah? But you have, to, um, you have to imagine what you can do within this one year under the legal environment um, you have. Yeah. Hence, um, it was very good to have the ECB as an already European institution with um, a settled HR and IT, as well as an, um, uh, yeah, a kind of experience how to solve um, um, different interests yeah, in a European environment. Yeah. Um, uh, so the setup was correct for exactly the timing and the problem we had at that point um, in time. If you are what we call Grüne Wiese, I don't know what you say, how you say this in English. Um, the, the green field, you might Green say. field, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then you might wish for here and there a different setup, yeah? Uh, but uh, you, have, you live in reality. And let us be very clear uh, for a banking supervisor, yeah? It's always very clear that you live in reality. So you make the best out of what you have. Yeah, and I yeah. think indeed there is always yeah. ro room for improvement. And yeah. Yes, I there is room for improvement, sure. and it's a fast-changing environment. So we will always have to change. Yeah. So you are evolving. Yes. You are constantly. Uh, well, the legal environment has to evolve too. For example, um, just to give you an idea, not talking so abstract. Yeah, I would have loved to have a different delegation system for doing decisions. Yeah, but the environment is that all the decisions have to be taken by the governing council because the primary law says it has to be the governing council. I would expect yeah, at one point in time to have a delegation framework as well as a decision-making structure yeah, which takes care of what should be the really very important high level you yeah, know, almost to death decision taken by the governing council, and which small ones can be taken, please not by us, but by head of divisions or head of sections. That would be wonderful. That is what I mean with regard to you have to live with reality, because the legal environment is as it is. is as it is, yes. Exactly. Right, okay. Looking to the future of banking, do you think banking models will change radically uh, due to the arrival of disruptors like fintech? We deal a lot here at Frankfurt School with uh, those entities showing up now and uh, kind of changing the, the landscape. Is this on a regulatory basis, on a supervision basis, going to change the picture as well? Well, I think bankers will always do uh, the, the, the core uh, mission of, of banks, uh, channeling, putting links between uh, uh, investors and uh, borrowers. Uh, but they can do it in many different ways, obviously. Uh, they can uh, do it in a more modern fashion with uh, fintechs, uh, using uh, IT uh, as the, the tool to, to do banking business. 
more likely they will use all kinds of tools because it depends very much on the profile of the customers. Huh? My granddaughter, which is 22, is doing everything with a telephone, but at the same time, she is not managing the savings of her whole life, and she had good eyes, and she does not have rheumatism in her fingers. So when she will be my age, she will go to see a traditional banker, spend some time to be explained what is best to uh, take care of the savings of her whole life, whatever the, the amount of savings, and she will uh, not use his, her fingers that uh, easily. On that yeah. we, shall, we shall see. <laughs> Uh, either that or she has uh, a very large framed uh, um, screen, right, uh, probably, and uh, not go to the bank, uh, if there will be a bank as we know it right now. Uh, but the core of the question was uh, also a little bit um, when things turn to the gray a little bit and, and uh, kind of move away of the possibility of uh, supervision, right? Uh, this ah, is, this shadow is, banking, this is you a, mean? Uh, this is a, a threat as well for your business as well as for the banks, right? Well, I don't, want, I don't know whether you want to start. Well, I, I don't feel threatened with regard to our workload, yeah? just to give you some kind of comfort. Yeah? Um, uh, we are far from being bored, um, and there's enough to supervise. Yeah? Um, but um, you are correct, you have to see uh, the competition via fintech in, in different ways. Yeah? First of all, it can be a chance, an opportunity for banks too, to change their way of doing banking activities, yeah? um, uh, to use the data in a different way they have collected um, uh, yeah, via their customers. Yeah? Um, that is the one item. Yeah? The second one is, yes, they, they get additional competitors which pick out certain um, activities, part of activities of the banking business which might not be even under a license requirement. And there it gets really tricky. Yeah? So if you have competitors which are not regulated, hence they do not have the cost which come with the regulation and the supervision, yeah? Uh, then you have to ask yourself, um, as a banker, um, how do I um, um, sequence my banking activities and might I outsource something, um, you know, which is not directly linked to the license in order then um, to have a certain kind of, of um, um, deburdening? Yeah, or the other way around, if I were, you know, somebody like Professor Grote, who seems to be concerned that there is enough regulation coming up in the next 10 years, um, you can ask yourself, when do fintech companies move into an environment where it is um, justified to, to be regulated? You know, when do they go into an area where out of data protection, out of uh, financial stability issues or whatever, it seems to be um, necessary to put them under supervision. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a, it's, it's a two-way street. And, and for sure, we will see perhaps in the next 10 years uh, um, a change in the, in the big companies where some will move into the regulated um, areas because they want to do the whole portfolio. Yeah? when others will try um, to keep into in the unregulated area and when the first crisis sits because of a fintech company, we will be back to regulation. Yeah? It's always, you know, uh, regulation and supervisors have a conjunctural cycle too. Thank you very much. Uh, before, as promised, opening up to you, uh, one last question to our uh, two panelists, um, which is very simple. Uh, but very interesting for students, I think. Uh, how do you like your job? Uh, the, the job of uh, being a banking supervisor, I, I like it very much. Uh, I never thought uh, when I started that I would stay for more than 40 years, but each time I thought maybe it's time to go and I had opportunities that were offered. Uh, I got something better to do, a promotion or a new job, a new opportunities in banking supervision, including uh, traveling a lot. I was in Basel for seven years uh, as Secretary General of the, the Basel Committee. I am in Frankfurt and I've been in Frankfurt for the last four years on the whole. It's a great job that is able to offer this kind of opportunities. Well, in New York too. 
I was in New York too. I was yeah. forgetting New York in 84, 85. Mm -hmm. It was when market operations <laughs> were starting. On the, in Europe, you were looking at the movie Wall Street as if it yeah. was something very big, on a big change. And I was asked, is it like that in the US? No, it's not like that. It's 10 or 100 times bigger, in fact, yeah. <laughs> and more complex. <laughs> And Madame Nui, you have to confess, uh, one of the big advantages of Frankfurt is that it's uh, four hours by train to Paris. Well, I, in fact, I take a plane, I, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, but the train might be an advantage, well, the, depending where you live in Paris. Well, uh, yes, well, I live in the center, so both are, uh, I don't know why. My husband is taking trains more often than I, it's a choice of the people. Yeah, of I'm, tr I'm taking planes so often uh, to try. I visit uh, each year the 19 uh, supervis national supervisors uh, that are working for us because we have uh, currently about 1,500 people working for us in Frankfurt, uh, counting as well the support services that are helping us from the rest of the ECB. And we have 2,000 supervisors working for us in the 19 countries. So I visit them uh, once a year to say thank you for the good work that they have been doing during the uh, all year and also to explain that I will still need the help in the coming months and explain the priorities and so on and so forth. So I'm taking place on planes all the time, so I get accustomed, I like it, it's easy, you can work in the lounges. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, also, same question, how do you like your job and why? Well, I like my job very much and I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Yeah? Um, I like my job the best on Friday. Friday morning at mm -hmm. nine o'clock, we both have weekly meeting, what we call weekly meeting, and it means that the senior managers come together and we talk about some of the upcoming cases, you know, some crisis cases, or we talk about policies which we would like to change, approaches we need to still establish, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's unbelievably rewarding to first see the staff around the senior managers, and then, you know, when we, we get presentation um, about certain topics, you have the staff who, who um, uh, prepared this around, first to see the committed people, how much dedication we have, huh? mm -hmm. how, how right. yeah. you know, yeah, how people live with their work, yeah? Um, second, it is unbelievably rewarding to see that we have so many different pools of experience, yeah? Uh, just to take the German supervisor, I, I, I'm super, I mean, I'm a supervisor now for uh, 23 or 24 years. I haven't experienced a real real estate crisis because uh, the prices were flat in Germany uh, during the years I um, um, was a supervisor, yeah? And my Spanish colleagues, they know everything about real estate crisis. Yeah? So when we are talking about real estate, the question of valuation, the question of what kind of tools do you have in order to get a trend very early, what kind of new products do we see, what kind of um, national laws do we have to look at in order to see some triggers or some concerns, etc., you have to ask the Spanish guys. They know everything, and I'm able to ask. So I get to know a lot about market risk from Danielle because she survived yeah, um, <laughs> some market crisis, yeah, oh. in, in, <laughs> in, in, in France, yeah. yeah. Um, I can share, I think, quite a lot about my experience closing down banks, yeah, because I, I, right. I, in Germany we do have some experiences which other countries do not have, yeah, um, or experiences about IPS. We have a very specific situation in Germany yeah. which moratorium, etc. Yeah, I can ask my Spanish colleagues about other uh, things. So the learning curve, yeah, and that's coming back to your first um, items. You can still learn with 68 and 69. You can learn until you are 90 when you work for the SSN. <laughs> yeah, I mean yes. it is an open field with 28 nationalities, with 28 different. Um, approaches learned from, from the national competent authorities merging, coming together and asking, I mean, that is our job on Friday at nine, asking for the best approach, mingling the approaches, yeah? And that's why uh, we are both so happy with our job because we design mm -hmm. um, the future of European banking.
And you already did in parts? Design hmm? future, you already did in parts in the past four years? What? Uh, I've designed different designing opinions? Designing the future? Yes, for sure. <laughs> I mean, very clear. I, I'm not sure I totally I mean, understand. Uh, I know, did, yes, we have the, uh, did we have uh, different views, both of no, us? No no no, oh, no, no, no. No, no, whether we designed the future of banking. Oh, yes, for sure. For sure. Oh, we were much sure tougher in, in many, oh, in, yeah. we were much tougher in many issues um, which the national supervisors might not have been so of uh, tough. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. We, uh, oh, look on the debate on non-performing loans. Yeah, hmm? I know. We, we, I think we got quite a lot of concerns from many external yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we designed right. the future. Ladies and gentlemen, this sounds like a fascinating place to work, but I bet you put in from the get-go like 60, 70, 80 hours. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, to admit. Yeah, hmm. So you think it over. Think it over if you want to apply for a job there. Um, first questions. I would love to see, I know that there are some journalists in here. Uh, I would love to see the journalist questions towards the end of our discussion. And please, let the students ask first. And uh, as announced, I would love to see a mix of live questions and Slido questions. Um, and I would like to start with a live question, if there's any right now to start with. You're not a student. Come on. Anyways, let's try this. Thank you. Now, my question is how uh, the ECB protects the personal safety and security of the bank supervisors who go into countries where they may have less than gentlemanly reactions to being told they are probably doing something wrong or uh, maybe shut down. Uh, I'm not thinking of Germany or France right now, but uh, some countries where the supervisors go in and may encounter maybe a little bit of hostility to, boot to the um, arguments or questions that they bring. My question is what the ECB does to protect their personal safety and security. Well, I am not very uh, knowledgeable about uh, all the resources that are used by the ECB. Maybe Sabine is because uh, uh, she is in the executive board of the ECB on what is the, uh, the rules of the games, uh, the, 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 the way the, the ECB is managed, the budget of the ECB is treated in the executive board where uh, I am not myself. But I always uh, felt uh, safe uh, in doing my job. When we are in going, going to countries which are uh, difficult, I even, uh, to be honest, feel overprotected. Uh, sometimes uh, I think, well, that cannot be that needed. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't see uh, any issue. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if we were doing um, money laundering supervision, for example, because this is something which is discussed whether there should be a money laundering authority for Europe. Personally, I believe so. Uh, I think it will be more complicated, probably. Uh, the, the degree of safety, the level of safety should be bigger. And again, I am sure the ECB or European Commission or uh, European institution can deliver this kind of protection, which is probably not uh, that easy for small countries with big neighbors uh, in this issue. But really, uh, we are well equipped with the ECB. Uh, we can uh, have somebody joining uh, us or our team when we are going in the places where they can be turmoil, but again, I felt overprotected, to be honest. Well, first of all, um, when there are on-sites, you usually don't go alone. You have several people around you, which always gives you a certain kind of protection. Then, um, I mean, you are usually not facing, I mean, you are not facing criminals, yeah? These are bankers, yeah? They open up your, your files. Um, well, usually you, I mean, no, I mean, yeah? Um, so, I, I'm not aware that anybody was b threatened in in body or you know in in these kind of yeah. I'm not aware of this. But um, if there are very tacky questions um, 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 to look at, yeah, uh, one of um, the possibilities, yeah, um, to deburden, yeah, the on-site inspect 
sectors is, and that we do use sometimes, is to ensure that we have a cross-border um, um, on-site inspections, meaning um, it's not the nationality or the, the on-site inspectors in, in the banks, you know, coming um, via the ECB are not, not from the same nationality, but they are from other nationalities. Yeah? Um, hence, you move in, um, you look into the files, you move out, and you will not see the bank or the country again if you do not need to. Yeah? Uh, which is, I think, uh, something that not only gives you a certain kind of protection, but it gives you, um, and, and, and here we, we are uh, thriving to increase um, this part in the cross-border on-site inspections, it gives you a broader scope of views uh, too. Yeah? Um, uh, but I, but I think, really, I mean, I, I have never heard from from somebody who was bodily threatened. Um, um, yeah. You have here and there sometimes a quarrel, yeah, a vocal one, because people have different positions. Yeah, um, um, uh, but it's not um, in a, in a in a it's not like in a bar fight, yeah, that you get with your fists, uh, <laughs> etc. But it's rather the question of are you able to say very clearly no. Are you able to, um, um, to, to put your point on the table and, and be, you know, straighten your back? And, and that is, should be for a supervisor. Um, when you want to be a supervisor, you need to have a straight back, yeah? And you need to be uh, forceful in, in, in your positions yeah? and outspoken. Yeah? So you, you are not supposed to be vague, nor are you sp supposed to say, oh, perhaps you can do yeah, uh, but uh, but you need to be much more forthcoming. Yeah. I expect you to do. We'll yeah, do. I expect you to do exactly. All right, uh, Slido question. So there's a shift in uh, number one and two and three questions, uh, and mm -hmm. of course the nature of some of the questions is more of a political um, uh, nature. And uh, the top question right now is: Do we need a common fiscal policy in Europe? Well, it's totally out of my territory. As a European citizens, I would have a view, but you are not here to listen to Daniel Nui, a European citizen, so I, I have nothing to respond to that. I, I would like Europe to be as united as possible. We should be uh, uh, European uh, jurisdiction, uh, but even in the US, there are different uh, states, di different taxes in the different states. Yeah, it depends really what you understand under common fiscal rules. I mean, we do have a stability and growth pact. We have rules around budgets, um, 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 which are related to, to the fiscal yeah, part. And uh, for sure, these kind of rules should be um, complied with. Yeah? Um, they are very important in order to cope with the hit, with Otherwise, an upcoming heterogeneity, and in particular for the currency union, it's very, and for monetary union, it's very important. But when you are talking about a joint fiscal budget, yeah, for all of the, are we talking about the euro area or the EU? I think well, it was an EU question, no wasn't it? Um, but, uh, yep. 28 minus one. Yeah. yeah? Um, uh, then um, um, you need to have all kinds of conditions and requirements to met to be met. Uh, before, yeah, um, but I, I join, and this is a political question, and for sure something would needs to be decided by the governments and not uh, by banking supervisors. But I'm a European citizen too, so I fully join Danielle privately. Yeah, we need to move forward um, um, in 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 the integration, and that is on a political, on a fiscal, on an economic, um, um, and in a financial well. uh, point. Um, I, I think our importance yeah, in the global context is extremely dependent on that we are united in the euro area, that we are united in the EU, because all of our countries alone are not important in a global, uh, on a global perspective. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, two remarks by uh, European citizens and mm -hmm. uh, not in their function they're sitting here today. So you pointed this out. Before. Except the compl compliance with the fiscal rules. Absolutely. Which we have already yes. in the stability. And yes, yeah. Um, question from uh, students uh, up there. Let me move there. Or you might go. It's uh, pretty far up there, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
I just wanted to ask that uh, while designing the future of banking from a regulatory point of view, how much has ECB considered cryptocurrencies and if they have, to what extent have they considered them? Thank you. We consider cryptocurrency when they are a risk for banks. So we try to understand how much the banks were involved uh, in dealing with cryptocurrencies, which uh, for the time being is very little. But it's true that certain market infrastructure start uh, uh, listing, quoting uh, some cryptocurrencies. And that's a source of concern for me because that could uh, encourage the, the banks, the banks we supervise, to be more involved in uh, cryptocurrencies. But for me, cryptocurrency is not a currency precisely. It's a kind of casino. And uh, uh, if banks are willing to take casino risk, for sure, we will try to uh, stop them and check how they mitigate the risk and then control the risk. But for the time being, it's not a source of concern, to the best of my knowledge. I don't know if you have a different view, Sabine. Well, on the banking supervisory part, uh, no. And I, I would add, too, if, if you hadn't said it already, um, for me, these are not currencies. Yeah? That's digital assets, or how you call very, them. Very, very clear answer that you probably didn't expect, right? Um, in, in that clarity, uh, I, I guess. Let's um, go to Slido real quickly. Um, this is one for Sabine Lautenschläger. What is the risk of uh, treating government bonds as risk-free assets on banks' books? Well, I mean, um, uh, let, me, let me take my personal position first. I, I truly believe that um, when I go um, in the capital framework for a bank, you know, according to risk sensitivity, meaning I'm looking at the assets um, um, and ask and require banks um, uh, to cover certain risks according to the risk sensitivity of the assets, um, then um, sovereigns and sovereign bonds should not be kept out of this risk sensitivity. So I'm not so much in, uh, in favor of, of having a zero risk weight um, uh, for sovereign bonds. I think there should be, according to the risk, uh, risk weights um, um, put to them. And I would always look as a banking supervisor too on the concentration risk linked to it. So meaning um, what kind of exposure does one bank have in one sovereign bond class yeah, in order to see um, um, and that we do uh, with large exposure rules in all other classes uh, too in order to, to, to ensure that um, a bank is not putting all the eggs in one basket uh, to say it bluntly. Yeah. Well, so it's exactly I'm, the yeah, same for me, yeah, as a matter yeah. of fact. Don't believe that uh, being French, yeah. I have a different view. Uh, yeah. I think they are not yeah. risk-free. So if it's not risk-free, it deserves uh, uh, capital. It can be short to start with, but uh, small. But uh, if, if it's not risk-free, it deserves to have capital in front of the risk. Yeah. So um, we had some questions now live. We might continue by those who were, is this still actual in the corner here? That you, uh, but we might start here as well. Okay, um, going forward. Okay, um, linked to the last question from Slido. Um, do you think, uh, or um, was it an issue in the la latest um, stress test? To, to stress that out, uh, whether there should be um, some, <coughs> some uh, um, capital for this, um, uh, what was it? Uh, sovereign. So, so, sovereign bonds. Do you, do you remember the scenario? No, I, to be honest, I, I don't uh, remember. Uh, th there is some elements, but th uh, they were bigger, in my view, in the previous uh, yeah. IBA stress test. It was not the main uh, element uh, this time, but there, there must have been something. Uh, to, to be honest, those are EBA stress tests. We are not even voting in EBA, Sabine or I, or the S SSM. Uh, so we take the scenario for what they are. Uh, and that was not the, 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 the main focus. It's good that we are not uh, setting the scenario because we could be uh, suspected of uh, uh, playing games, maybe uh, taking scenario that we would uh, prefer to have. So we take 
what we are given and we uh, make it uh, implement, we implement it for our banks and do the, the, the quality assurance. So in 2016, it, there was a major part um, this. I think in 2018, you have it anyway indirectly via setting certain rate scenarii, you know, for, for the rates. Uh, but I'm, I'm very sorry that I didn't focus on the last. Uh, Back to Slido real quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see that, that for both questions, uh, even though they are completely political, and you will now say I'm not going to answer to this, uh, 15 people each liked it, so I'm still going to ask those two questions. Number one, do Germany and France also, also influence the decisions of ECB as they do EU, if yes, to what extent? And the number two, can the Eurozone survive a downgrade of Italy's credit ranking to junk, which will destabilize its finances and force massive bailouts? All two strongly political questions, uh, but a lot of people uh, feel some sympathy for those. I at least want to ask them. We, we try to forget the, the nationalities, really, uh, and to make sure we manage. In fact, Sabine is more taking care of the French banks now, uh, and I'm, I'm more taking care of the German uh, banks to precisely demonstrate neutrality, and uh, we, we focus really on the, on the banks more than on, on the nationality of the bank, on the, the banking system. In fact, it's also why I like to visit the 19 uh, national companies on authorities, the 19 countries, because in Frankfurt, I, I see the banks. Uh, I compare a bank with another bank or other banks. Uh, but when I go to these countries, I can feel the DNA of the banking sector, and I have to uh, do a little bit of homework to know better what are the specificities of, of the banks. So uh, it's, the, it's the way it works, really. And I, I think... Uh, it was already like that in the Basel Committee, and I think it's the same in the supervisory board. Uh, people have influence uh, based on their credibility. If they are hard workers, they know what they are take, talking about, and uh, they are able to explain and convince, uh, to convince other people. It's not a matter of nationality very much. Well, it happens that we are French and German, but uh, just like that. Uh, well, let us not forget that in the supervisory board we have 26 authorities being represented, yeah? um, uh, meaning that um, um, if there are discussions or when they are voting, it's not um, um, the Germans or the French being in, in the majority. Yeah? Um, but it's rather that each country has uh, one vote plus um, um, theoretically six ECB representatives, which means we have 25. Um, which are bringing together their knowledge and their positions and opinions, and hence it cannot be dominated by Germany and, and France in the decisions. Yeah? And it's even the uh, other way around, yeah. because uh, the, the vote of small countries like uh, Lithuania, Slovenia, or whatever, uh, is as important for uh, Deutsche Bank and BNPP or Santander as the German, French, and Spanish vote. So it's uh, incredibly uh, democratic, really. Thank you very much. Um, we had uh, many questions. Uh, so you, we forgot the second one. I can give no. you an answer if you wish to. Well, well, please. Um, do you still have it in mind? Yeah, yeah, I know okay. which it is. Sure. It's about the Italian um, situation. Italy, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, first of all, I would like to really stress here yeah, that in the last five years, and that is, you know, about the design of the future, um, yeah. Um, of, of banks, yeah, we did our utmost to strengthen the European banking sector, and that means we strengthened Italian banks too, yeah, <laughs> increase in capital, improvement of governments, governance, increase or improvement in risk management, more liquidity, yeah, less NPLs. Okay, so the resilience of the European banking sector uh, improved quite a lot. 
Yeah? Um, that is the first fact I would like to stress here. Yeah? Um, otherwise, we are going out um, of this meeting with, uh, with nothing. And, and the rest, let me be very uh, clear. Um, I mean, this is an if situation, if whatever, yeah? Uh, um, yeah. A lot of ifs, uh, yeah. sometimes most interesting for yeah. uh, audiences, right? And yes, I, and... I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame anybody for asking those questions. No, 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 no you no, shouldn't, no, you no shouldn't. But as a banking supervisor, too, it is very important to always understand and to make the audience to understand, too, that we see banks idiosyncratically. So we are not seeing banks as banks coming from a country, and that's why banks are like that, like that. They are weak banks and strong bands in each of the countries um, of the 19 ones we are looking um, um, at. So we see them idiosyncratically with all of their niceties and not so nice things. <laughs> there might be some advice from you to the uh, political Europe in, in Brussels, probably from your findings uh, in, in, in your jobs, right? Uh, because Well, we have different uh, objectives and tasks. I mean, I would right. refrain from giving um, um, recommendations there because our objective is a different one. Sure. Uh -huh. okay. We may make recommendations on the legislation. For example, I yeah. spend a lot of time asking for harmonization of the legal yeah. framework, improvement in the fit and proper, uh, the, the qualities that the senior management and board members must present in a bank, which is an old part of the directive, uh, minimal harmonization uh, taken long time ago, so not fit for, for, for the challenges of new banking. Uh, we advise a lot on legislation, because we are asked of views, we give them, doesn't mean that we get them, huh, to be honest, but we express it. <laughs> Thank you. We have a lot of questions. Uh, you have been waiting there in the back for so long, and one person over there has been waiting, and as we did two slidos, we're doing two live questions right now. Uh, quite a stretch to walk. Maybe I would come visit you over there in the meantime. Okay, please go. My question goes for both the panelists. Actually, the way you describe that um, you meet in the Friday meetings and take uh, various decisions or policies, decide upon them. Um, do you feel that there is a lot of bureaucracy in ECB and to an extent that leads to a lot of unnecessary delay in the decision-taking process? Um, if you believe so, then how can we maybe um, see that this thing doesn't happen or that's all? Thank you. Want to keep it in mind and we collect, or do you want mm? to answer while no. I'm going up there? Okay. You might answer in the meantime. Would you like to answer? Well, I can bureaucracy. start. Uh, well, uh, I am not a fan of bureaucracy, but uh, it's also very helpful to help us do our work, uh, the quality of the, the processes, the, the, the procedure. What is a delaying uh, action is what Sabine already mentioned, the lack of delegation. We are probably one of the very few, if not the only one, uh, international institution with zero delegation uh, capacity in the text, which when you take uh, more than 2,000 on around 2,500 decisions per year, you see uh, you don't need the bureaucracy to create something heavy and not agile enough. It's just the number of decisions that we take. So that's why we would need to have this uh, delegation capacity in the, in the text. Uh, something which is also creating uh, difficulties is that uh, we, are, we would like to have regulation in Europe, meaning uh, a rule that is implemented uh, as such and directly from uh, Europe uh, for the SSM. We have directives mostly, and directives are transposed in 19 different ways in the different countries. I could not believe the level of creativity we could find uh, in the transpositions of directive in the 19 different countries. So also this is uh, uh, creating uh, delays. We need to have a lot of lawyers. I don't know whether there are lawyers uh, in this room, but uh, if we go on like that, uh, you have a brilliant futures on a lot of jobs because we, we need to have the different teams able to explain to us the, the national transposition of the, of the directives. So this is what is maybe not permitting us to be agile enough. So this is what should be treated. Bureaucracy, I, I don't believe, 
really, but uh, Sabine, in fact, I am spoiled because Sabine in the executive board is taking all the administrative decisions that could turn in, uh, uh, in bureaucracy. I, I am the one doing 100% supervision, thanks to Sabine helping on the administrative decisions in the executive board. Well, I think you first really have to define what bureaucracy is about. Yeah? When you try to move 26 authorities with about 3,000, 4,000 staff altogether in the same direction for the same case, meaning you have to ensure equal treatment, yeah? then you need some procedures around it and you need a common approach in order to ensure that you are not going into different directions for the same risk with the same business. Yeah. Uh, and the same rules, because rules are usually not that concrete. Yeah? You have a lot of discretion as a supervisor, which makes it so sexy. Being a supervisor, you have a lot of discretion. Yeah? Um, so um, this is for me not bureaucracy, it, but it's rather the question of how to harmonize and to ensure that you have a credible, um, equal treatment uh, with the banks. Yeah? The rest is, um, I mean, we have a delegation, a question because of the primary law and, and the legal environment uh, we have to live with. And the rest is not so much bureaucracy, but it is rather the question of um, are you used to change um, the way of working, which you did the last 20 year, years in your national authorities, and now you move into a different environment. Yeah, And sometimes people um, see this as a bureaucracy, but it's just a different working environment. Yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah, you have to you have to use your computer and click, you know, certain things in in Buffin, for example, too. Yeah, and now you have to click a different IT system with a different um, maske, with a different yeah counterfeit. But it's uh, it, that is not for me bureaucracy. Yeah. No, not really. We are pretty hands on, you know. Yeah, very <laughs> hands on. Yeah, very. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've been waiting for a while now, please. Uh, hello. My question is, so there's, uh, there has been a miss between certain risk-taking and profitability-driven activities in the banks. And as we have seen after the financial crisis, um, may some European banks has been shrinking or deteriorating from market-making market -making activities because of the certain regulations. And there are also some. There are also some major European banks performed very bad. Not not very bad. Performed just above above the threshold on the stress test. And but the uh, but after ever since financial crisis, their performance is, has not been improving significantly. So, what's your opinion on a more consolidated European banking industry? Considering currently there are more than six thousand European like banks in your area. Well, there Thank are a lot much. of good questions in your questions. Uh, you. uh, let me start on a, <laughs> with consolidation, the, la the last uh, point. Uh, yes, we, uh, we have probably an excess of banking, uh, of offer of banking services in Europe, and there should be some consolidation. Uh, supervisors are not the people that should tell what is good consolidation, what is a good merger. Uh, the banks, the investors, the market participants should uh, decide what are the good mergers. But we have a very important role, nevertheless, supervisors. Uh, we have to say yes or no when we receive uh, the, the request for authorizing a merger. Uh, sometimes it's a blunt no to start with. Uh, for example, uh, we can say two weak banks. Uh, I use a German stance, I believe. Huh? Two, two ducks Ugly don't ducks. make us uh, yeah. make a swan. Huh? And I say two sick ducks don't make a swan. So uh, first you clean your balance sheet and then you come back to see me and we will discuss a possible merger. Uh, but most of the time uh, we... Uh, do a lot of work to see uh, what is making sense, where are the synergies, what are the, uh, the, 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 the benefits, uh, and uh, we end up with conditions. Uh, for example, uh, if you do that, you need a bit more capital for cleaning the, the balance sheet for non-performing non exposures, for example, or for uh, covering uh, uh, different, to have a bright new IT because the, the, your two ITs that you would like to merge will never talk together. They are too, uh, too old fashioned or, or whatever. Mergers are very dangerous operations. 
conditions. Uh, they have to be properly assessed on the proper condition have to be, to be put. In general, when we put our conditions, the banks consider that they are far too tough, uh, some would say extravagant, uh, but we stick to them because we believe that the, they are the, the, the good conditions and always they are just enough. In fact, because there are execution risks, there, there are synergies that were foreseen but are not yet there. Then uh, you mentioned uh, non-performing exposures, uh, market operation. Well, first of all, uh, the risk appetite for market risk and market operation has uh, gone down uh, after the, the crisis a lot. It will not stay like that because bankers are human beings and human beings forget the lessons that they have learned painfully uh, some time ago. So uh, the, the current context is also permitting to have uh, more leverage finance, for example. So we supervise very carefully uh, leverage finance. Uh, Non-performing exposures, those are the legacies of the crisis, mostly, not only, but mostly on that. Uh, we don't want the banks to enter into the next crisis with the legacy of the previous one. That would be a bad uh, start uh, on, for sure, a recipe for disaster. But I had just surf on the, the issues. I'm sure you want to add things on this. Well, um, with regard to consolidation, um, um, I mean, we, we, Daniela already talked about uh, mergers, et cetera, about perhaps shrinking the balance sheet. Um, I could add um, one of the items we have to get used to is, too, that banks exit the market. Uh, um, our task and our objective is not to ensure that all of the banks yeah, will forever um, um, be established and be, you know, in the market existent. Uh, but our task is um, um, to see uh, problems coming pretty early, identify them, assess them, and then, um, you know, have an orderly solution. Whatever the solution might be, mm -hmm. a merger, a capital increase, a shrinking of the balance sheet, or an exit uh, from the market. Yeah? And the last thing often was not really yeah, seen as a solution. But, but at the end, banking is a very economic yeah, um, activity, uh, meaning um, if you want to have um, a healthy banking sector, yeah, the ones which on a permanent basis do not have a viable business model, cannot find a viable business model, um, um, and, and do not have other solution, um, they should exit the market. Yeah. We have uh, many <coughs> questions uh, that are um, political-oriented, um, but one that is basically yes or no, and I like it because 39 people <coughs> like this question, and uh, it speaks for the sympathy you're creating here. Do you offer internships? Yes, ECB <laughs> has, uh, is offering internship, and it's even, thanks to the SSM, a double internship, because they are the internship that existed uh, before the, the ECB, and they are a specific internship for, for SSM, for supervision. And uh, if I remember well, the program is spent uh, partly uh, in the ECB in Frankfurt, and partly in one of the national competent authority in another country. What do I have to bring to the table um, for an internship? Well, I, I, that I cannot tell, but go to the, to the internet uh, website of the ECB, on that right. you will see what is uh, required. The competition is tough. Uh, there are a lot of applicants. Of course, yeah. All right. Uh, next question from here. The gentleman here, over here, has been waiting the longest, I think. Uh, microphone is over here. If you raise your hand, probably again because I don't know if you've seen it. Please. Hello, many thanks to uh, uh, both of you. Uh, I'm Michael, French, um, MBA grad. Uh, so I would like to articulate my question in two parts. The, uh, Mrs. Uh, Lautenschläger, you, you mentioned two main things. One is uh, you talked about resilience. The second thing was basically uh, you, met, you said banks are, is an economic uh, business. So um, my question is, uh, if the, the prerogative of the European Central Bank is price stability, uh, 
to what extent regulation constitutes a threat to price stability, which is, by in, which is infinite economy and their economy pr uh, prosperity. Mm -hmm. And the second part uh, of my question might be out of your scope of responsibility, but uh, I would give it a try. Uh, uh, for how long do you think that the European Central Bank will be buying time for uh, structural reform and political uh, uh, changes? Thank you. Well, yeah. Shall I start? The, for sure, yeah. because okay. it, well, I it's mean, much monetary um, policy, the first part. Yeah, yeah, the first part is for sure monetary policy. Also, I have to admit that I have a little bit of a problem to understand the question because price stability. Um, um, is always an economic concept, yeah, in an, in an um, environment which um, is reality, and reality is that you do not have um, 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 that, that that there were always rules and regulation uh, around it, yeah. Um, so, um, as as uh, um, somebody from from the monetary policy part, you have to live with the regulations done. Um, by um, the EU Parliament or the national parliaments, etc. Yeah? Um, that is reality, and um, there might be consequences coming out of it. For example, if you have um, um, regulation um, in, in, in certain um, economic sectors which restrict economic activities, you, will, you might see this in, in the growth prospect of a country if you have very tight labor uh, market rules, for example, you will see this in the growth perspective, but you have to live with this as, a, as uh, somebody from the central bank. Yeah? I mean, that it is as it is, yeah? as I say. Um, it's it's Rheinisch. I, you have to laugh about it because <laughs> we, are both, we are both from the area, from the Rhineland, and there it is a um, geflügeltes Wort. It is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is, yes. Um, and it had not a majority younger, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Um, um, also, war Wort. Yeah, sorry, that is only for the Germans, yeah. And, on, and only for the one who understands uh, uh, Cologne accent, yeah. Um, okay, um, the second question was, what was the second question again? Um, it was about was, buying time. Buy ah, buying time. Um, well, um, the, the monetary policy decisions can only be based on um, the objective of the central bank, and the objective of the central bank is to maintain price stability or to move to price stability in the medium uh, perspective. Yeah? Um, in the objective or um, the goals to, um, you want to reach as um, a central banker cannot be and should not be buying time for others. It might be yeah, a kind of unintended consequence yeah, for the one or the other, but it cannot be the goal or the objective. So when you are in an environment um, like in the last years where um, you do have forward-looking um, 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 a, um, a price uh, rate, um, Teuerungsrate, um, an inflation rate, I'm very sorry, um, an inflation rate of um, um, very clearly below 2%, you know, all, all of you know 2% below, close, um, but below 2% is our, is our aim. When you have um, um, inflation rates which are um, um, relevantly below this aim, you have to think as a central bank about what are you going to do and what kind of measures, standard measures first, and then might be non-standard measures you have to take in order um, um, to maintain this price stability uh, goal. Yeah? But it's not about um, uh, buying time. Uh, uh, let me be very clear too. Um, when, you do have, um, when you do have these kind of standard and non-standard uh, measures, you might be setting incentives for external stakeholders, yeah? which is not your goal. Yeah? Uh, but that doesn't mean that you cannot just ignore if you are not having price stability. Yeah? But you have to look into when, when you are um, balancing um, um, your decisions, you have to look into what are you supposed to achieve in what kind of time frame and what are the costs, what are the risks, what are the side effects. Um, and one of the side effects can be 
um, that with a very extraordinary expansionary um, um, accommodative monetary policy that you increase the risk for financial stability, for asset bubbles, etc., and that you have to monitor. And the longer you, you have this accommodative monetary policy, the more the risk increase, and hence the balance, you know, for changing uh, monetary policy uh, changes, you know, um, to the other side. Yeah? Which means I'm very much in favor of ending and exiting the net purchase programs. Just to be concrete. <laughs> Cor the money supply, that's why you basically did. Uh, we would not have asset bubble if the, 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 the structural reform were taken. And by that, I mean, uh, uh, um, so you are proposing you are proposing not to do anything in order for the others to do the right things. No, no. E also, you have an objective of price stability. I mean, even I, as a German, and I'm typically pretty conservative in monetary policy as a German, yeah, I wouldn't do. I wouldn't say this, yeah? So if you do have a, a very low core inflation rate as well as uh, HSCP, um, both low in the medium term, you have to take your standard measures, otherwise you don't do your job. But you have to take over the time horizon a kind of cost-benefit analysis um, because the longer you have this kind of accommodative monetary policy, the more the risk increase. Um, when we are talking about asset bubbles, depending on where they are pro uh, being produced and, and um, emerging, there you can take some of the macroprudential tools, you know, the new macroprudential framework, uh, which can then deburden monetary policy um, from these kind of considerations um, when you use them accordingly and forcefully. Yeah, so if you do see, for example, real estate bubble, I would expect the counter-cyclical buffer, I would expect the LTV ratio, I would expect the risk-weighted assets ratio to be increased, but not only for banks, but in the overall environment, yeah, in order to then mitigate these kind of risks. I, I, I fully uh, understand the, the points, and I appreciate your engagement. Mm. Uh, but my, let me finish my point. Uh, what I mean, you, you also touched it. We, we, the scope is, is the whole economy. By, uh, with the European Central Bank uh, pushing in the money supply, uh, we will again uh, not face any asset bubble if the, the, if the, the government, so the, the, the structural reform and the, and the policies were basically taken by creating what we are all missing yes. in Europe that is, basi that is actually uh, investment opportunities for our economies. We need to create these investment opportunities to basically absorb the, the, the supply of money that we have uh, that actually was a response to the 2008 event. So this is actually my point when I was saying, ah, okay. when I was saying how much time are we buying at the European Central Bank for the politics. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. But uh, let me clarify too. Uh, I fully sure, agree with him. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I fully agree with him. And I mean, if you look into, as soon as you look into the introductory statement of the press uh, conference or um, of the president of the ECB, you will always find quite a strong, quite a strong message coming from the ECB. Um, there needs to be structural reforms uh, being done. Um, the um, national economies have to uh, get more competitive. They have to open up uh, their service market. Um, they have to do um, uh, changes in, in the labor laws, in the investment uh, policies, um, etc. So here I fully agree. But uh, for me, your question was rather, um, you know, a little bit like, don't do anything because otherwise the others don't. Yeah? I, I would say that structural reforms are in the hands of politicians uh, and we are a democracy. This is where the limits of uh, what can be done by administration on institutions, even great institutions with good credibility, reputation and so on and so forth can do. I think we have to, to respect the, the job on the limitation of powers as well. Yeah. 
Due to the fact that uh, it is seven minutes to six and we agreed to be done by six, uh, let us uh, try to uh, take two sliders right now. So one is, again, a political question. The Federal Reserve has acted and is about to act again, rising interest. And uh, the uh, formulation here is, why is it that ECB doesn't try to normalize the interest rates? And the second question, maybe uh, you answer to this one. The second question is to uh, Mrs. Nui. Um, what was your greatest challenge during your time as the head of the SSM? And what was your greatest mistake? Maybe we start with the Fed question and the follow-up by the ECB, which is again, uh, of course, monetary policy. Monetary policy. Mm. Well, I think the, the, the Fed, um, is working with an environment where the cycle is in a different um, status or uh, yeah so meaning um, um, they have um, um, an economy uh, and they look into the labor market too by the way which we do not have as an objective um, and um, they have um, um, an inflation rate where um, the um, uh, yeah raising interest rate yeah, is in a different, w with a different reasoning uh, behind it. We are not yet there, not yet fully there. Uh, for us, uh, the next uh, step uh, will be um, the final decision on exiting the net purchase programs um, and, and then uh, doing um, a decision about the design of the reinvestment. Yeah? And as I told you very concretely and very bluntly, like a supervisor, yeah? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite in favor of, of doing the final step, exiting the net purchase programs um, and um, designing something what is flexible um, in the reinvestment part, which will still have a huge accommodative um, um, uh, consequence yeah? and, and follow up um, to design this kind of reinvestment in, in a flexible way, not too long in order to, um, to adapt and adjust to a changing um, environment um, with regard to the inflation rate. Uh, um, we just have to, I think, compare the core inflation rate of the, um, of the US with ours Absolutely. in the medium and in the long term, and then you see the differences, yeah. yeah. Madame Nui, our great well, but I'm, I'm confident, yeah? I'm confident. Yes, mm. thank you. Well, uh, I tr tend to focus on the next one, so I would say my uh, biggest challenge is tomorrow's challenge. I don't know exactly w what it will be. Uh, otherwise, I would maybe say non-performing exposures, because when you start with a trillion, now we are at 650, about a uh, billion. Uh, but it's getting down almost by uh, each day, uh, because the tools are in place now. Uh, biggest mistake, well, in it will look uh, complacent and arrogant, but um, in fact, we have a system that is preventing uh, mistakes to a large extent because we did it uh, building this institution very much together, Sabine and I. Uh, we, are, uh, we don't take decisions alone, you have understood, we have no delegation. So uh, our decisions is what we propose to the supervisory board members because it has a big chance to be uh, taken, uh, not always, but uh, or not always without uh, difficult discussions, but uh, it's important to propose the, the, the good way forward. And if it happens that Sabine and I do not agree on what is the best way forward, well, then I, I want to take, uh, to have a second thought, uh, really, on the discussion with, with Sabine. It, it happens very, very scarcely. But it may happen, a small, very small percentage. So I, we need to understand uh, why, in this case, is it that uh, uh, we, uh, I, I am wrong, let's take my example, maybe I'm wrong, she's right, okay, I can uh, admit it very, uh, very easily if this is the case, or maybe um, she will abstain, she is not against, but for her, we are a little bit too uh, nice in uh, proposing a positive solution. And I have a tendency to be 
pretty tough, in fact. I have the reputation of being pretty tough. But for example, when you have uh, a bank coming uh, willing to take care of uh, dozens of uh, billions of uh, non-performing exposures in one shot, if the bank uh, is willing to have a little bit of uh, accommodation on certain things, I would tend to, to say yes, really. And uh, I think I am still fair, because something which is important, you can be tough if you are fair. If banks believe that you are not equally tough, you are in trouble. Uh, but, uh, for example, uh, we, when we were asked uh, for massive one-shot uh, sales of non-performing exposures, uh, to have some kind of carve-out of the loss given default uh, for this specific portfolio uh, for the parameters of the models. Uh, if it's really a massive one-shot sale, uh, and this is possible in the legislation. The, the, the room for maneuvering is uh, narrow, but it exists in the legislation. That's one of the points on, on which I would say, okay, let's have it to get uh, dozens of non-performing exposures out of in you know, a one shot of the balance sheet. Uh, Sabine might think twice on uh, may abstain. Uh, on this, but in fact, we know perfectly well why we are, and it's not so different at the end of the day. So for me, my insurance is that Sabine agrees with me. If she agrees with me, I don't make mistake. I am sure. We come from different perspectives, different <laughs> right. countries, different past. Uh, but if we disagree on something, we have to discuss it and to know exactly why, on whether it's a strong disagreement or just we are just close. She is not making the ultimate last step. Uh, well, which is a more balance than anything else in this case. Internal. Uh, mechanism that yes, I think it's uh, the four I principles. Huh? The four yeah. I principles <laughs> that we enforce for banks. Exactly, exactly. We we use it very well. So we reached uh, our time, but I guess we start a little late. So if anybody of you guys have a really short question to come to an end, uh, we would gladly take it from here. You have one um, here over there, please, um, and. Um, Oops. So she's moving. I'm so sorry to another uh, direction. Get a second that's, short that's question. Okay. Don't worry. So journal, <laughs> journalists are on. Um, not a journalist, but, but in banking. Um, so do you feel now confident enough um, so that we have overcome here all the troubles with too big to fail, too complex to fail, too many to fail? So yes or no? That's a, that's a yes or no question, and please let us collect up front here the, the very final question then, because I, I <coughs> promised him that he'll be in um, uh, right now. First row here, second row, yes. Uh, and we collect, uh, collect both questions, okay? All right, so my question is, um, in Europe we see a lot uh, high numbers of corporate debt, and uh, as soon as we're ending uh, the really low interest rates in Europe. Um, do you think that we will get in trouble or a lot of um, firms were not able to pay back their debt? So one non-assessment question, well, but the first one definitely was one. Please. Well, too big to fail. As soon as we will be a single jurisdiction in the euro area, and this is the objective, uh, we should be a single jurisdiction. The supervisors take their decision uh, together around the, the, the same table in the, in the same board. But we are, st <coughs> we are still missing the, the backup, the, the joint backup for the single resolution fund, and we are still missing the deposit guarantee scheme. As soon as we have that, we will be for sure a single jurisdiction plus our efforts to harmonize and to treat all the banks in the, in the same fashion. Then we are too big to fail has not disappeared, but what is too big to fail for a single country uh, may not be too big to fail for 19 countries in the euro area. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we have pro make we have made some progress in addressing too big to fail as such, whatever the, the, the size of the jurisdiction. Uh, we have this uh, TILAC or MREL, uh, what we call in our jargon, gun concern capital, meaning capital that can be bailing to liquidate a bank, meaning that those who 
take the benefits of the, the bank when it was uh, uh, making benefits are also the ones that uh, pay the bill when the bank is not uh, doing well, then uh, we will uh, be more equipped to also take uh, into account and address the, the situation of too big to fail even in a bigger context. But for the time being, we are not a single jurisdiction yet, uh, unfortunately, uh, but that would help to, to fix certain uh, issues of the past, like uh, excess of uh, banking services in Europe. We have to move towards a single jurisdiction, in my view. Second question was about uh, corporate debt. Well, I mean, for sure, when you have a long period of a very accommodative expansionary monetary policy with a lot of liquidity in the market where people are looking for, you know, um, for search for yield. Uh, and there's always a risk when you have a kind of snapback yeah, of, of the interest rate with, with, you know, getting out of a very liquid uh, market. There's always a risk of do all of the actors and all of the, you know, companies have a strategy how to cope with um, um, an increasing um, rate environment or less liquidity. Yeah? There is a certain risk uh, to it, and it means that we have to, and we do this, yeah? we have to um, raise awareness too, uh, to be prepared. Yeah? And being prepared means that you have a diversification um, in the different financing yeah? uh, tools, that you have a diversification in maturities, um, um, that you have an idea what kind of collateral could you, for example, use, uh, because it's quite different to have a corporate debt with regard to a bond, um, or having a, a debt um, 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 for, uh, with, with, with a bank. Yeah? Um, so, yes, I think it is very important um, that um, people get prepared yeah, for a change, um, but I cannot imagine, I do not know, but I cannot imagine that you will see a quick change in a, in a very big steps, you know what I mean, um, depending on um, how um, um, the uh, inflation rate is evolving, for sure. I mean, it's data dependent. Yeah? Um, important is, too, I, I believe that um, not only preparing uh, but um, being aware um, that um, the growth pro prospect, you know, when uh, companies uh, can earn themselves out yeah, of these kind of financing needs, uh, when they have, um, when they are competitive yeah, in their environment, we are coming back to the structural reforms and, and the regulation you meant, yeah, when, they are, um, um, when they are having a positive uh, future, yeah, uh, then you will always see an improvement uh, where um, um, other stakeholders take over yeah, the financing because this, this company has a future. So being prepared means not only diversification, but, but um, being healthy, yeah? having sound policies as a company, etc. Yeah? Having a good uh, match between debt and, and um, capital, cash and liquidity needs, etc. Madame Nui, um, SSM now has, uh, and it's a, it's a good tradition to, to have a closing remark looking into the future. Um, SSM now has a, uh, a, his, a small, very small history of four years. Uh, therefore, it's appropriate to ask, um, where does it stand in four years from now? Well, that's uh, a bit uh, complicated uh, to respond. I do not have a crystal ball. Uh, but uh, what I know is that uh, there will be a next crisis. I don't know when it will come. I don't know uh, what will trigger this crisis. So we are uh, very much uh, thinking about uh, making sure that the banks can sustain the, the next uh, crisis. Uh, this is something that we all have in mind, and that's why we are putting such a big focus also on non-performing exposures, 
or uh, assessing valuations of uh, market risk through different uh, instruments. Uh, we need to be to have safe and sound. This is all the the, the whole story, in fact. Huh? Uh, we need to have safe and sound banks. And our job is to make sure the bank are safer and sounder. And uh, this includes uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that they are ready for the next uh, crisis, wherever it comes from. Thank you very much. Um, in addition to that, remarks? In the next four years? years? Well, um, I would rather ask myself where would I like us to be in four years? Huh? It's also welcome. Uh, I think that is, um, um, I mean, for sure, I would love to have more harmonization in the legal environment, yeah, to have, um, you know, more regulation and not directives so that we do not have to work with 19 different national laws, which we now apply, 19 different uh, national laws. I would love to have um, um, a new insolvency law. Yeah? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so ambitious to say we, I want to have one European insolvency law, but I would like to have one additional one where companies can opt in to have a European insolvency regime, you know, where you um, um, at the end can provide for the capital market, for the financing of companies, a bigger market, because often cross-border financing in companies are not done because, um, 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 you know, stakeholders do not know or do not want to deal with different national insolvency laws. So like, you know, having the European society, um, uh, the hmm? uh, European Six company, years, hmm? yeah, it would be good to have one additional European insolvency law. I think this would bring us forward, you know, in not only banking supervision, but the capital market union um, in, 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 in many, many issues. These kind of things I would like to see evolving and that would help us quite a lot. Yeah, indeed. So we have a wish list and we have uh, on the ground preparing for the next crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the ECB Youth Dialogue and again with uh, Daniel Nui and uh, Sabine Lautenschläger. And uh, it was a pleasure and honor to have you here at Frankfurt School. Thank you very much for sharing all this. Many thanks. Wow. <laughs>